Our scripture is from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Let us open our hearts to hear what the Spirit would say to God's people. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May the truth of these words be written upon our hearts and transform our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Okay, John, do this. <laughs> Sorry. So let's start with a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the blessing of gathering here today. Please open our hearts and our minds to hear the message for each of us today. Amen. So today is the third Sunday after Epiphany, and the gospel reading we heard is considered to be the story of the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Of course, this happens after his river baptism, where the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven proclaimed, You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And after his baptism, Jesus was tested in the wilderness for 40 days. After he passed these temptations, Luke tells us that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. And Jesus was teaching in their synagogues. And everybody praised him. So when he returned to his hometown of Nazareth, he had already made somewhat of a name for himself. Of course, the problem in Nazareth is that everybody knows him as Joseph's boy. Now, we really don't know much about Jesus' childhood from the Gospels other than a story of when he was 12. In Luke chapter 2, he tells of his parents left town without him, and after three days, they find him sitting in the temple, listening to the teachers and asking questions. Of course, this wasn't enough information for some people, and so some additional writings would appear, like the infancy gospel of Thomas. And in this gospel, it considers what a child with Jesus' powers would be like, or how would he use them? In this account, Jesus is somewhat of a mischievous bully. In one story, he fashioned 12 sparrows out of clay. And when he was uh, called out for doing this on Sabbath, uh, Jesus made the clay sparrows come alive and they fly away. And in another story, some child bumps into Jesus, which uh, provokes him. And so Jesus cursed him and the other child just dropped dead. Now in Luke, it says Jesus grew with wisdom and stature and with favor of God and man. And I doubt if that would be true if uh, the uh, infancy gospel of Thomas was true, where Jesus seemed kind of like a terrible child. So I tend to think Luke's account is certainly more valid. But I like to think Jesus had sort of a normal childhood probably got into the usual mischief that 
teenagers do. Um, I don't know what kind of mischief teenagers in ancient Palestine would get into. Uh, maybe drinking, partying, skipping school. Uh, that was me. Uh, maybe uh, Jesus was more like Mary. Her teenage rebellion was becoming Catholic. Um, maybe Jesus spent all day in the synagogue instead of helping Joseph in the, the shop, maybe sweeping up sawdust off the floor. But, you know, what does it really matter, you know, what kind of child or teenager Jesus was? I mean, why do we would even waste time thinking about it? But I think it's good to consider these things because of the incarnation. Too often we just think of Jesus as some divine miracle worker, and we forget his humanity, that Jesus was just as human as you and I. And as Luke said, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. He matured as he grew. Well, I suppose he was probably learning carpentry from his father, Joseph. His parents would have brought him to the synagogue every week. He'd hear the scriptures read. When he was age, he would have been asked to read also. But nothing big or out of the ordinary, other than we may have he may have been known for his thoughtful questions and, and was respected. So this brings us to this moment where Jesus has returned after his baptism and wilderness experiences. He has been filled with God's spirit and he stands up to read a scroll, which is probably done many times before. But this time it's different. This time, Jesus takes all this as his mission statement. So when he sits down to teach, like he has probably done before, but now claiming the text for himself, all hell must have broken out. Everything that follows in his life will amount to the living out of the prophecy he claims for himself that Sabbath morning in Nazareth. And he keeps doing these things until it finally kills him. Some people are pleased and happy with what Jesus does. But there are many who do not because it upsets their unfair advantage, questions their complacency, and pushes them to recognize their unfaithfulness to God these people will find their discomfort increasingly intolerable and think that the judicial murder of Jesus will bring an end to the matter. But they are wrong. We know the end of the story. Jesus rises and continues today to do what he talked about that Sabbath morning long ago. Jesus still does these things because his church does them. The poor gain hope, whether it's their souls or their bodies that are starved. The captive experience freedom, whether they are prisoners in a jail or prisoners in a mansion. The blind receive sight, whether it's cataract surgery at the hospital or the scales of prejudice falling off the eyes of a bigot. Huh. The oppressed are set free, whether oppression is a political regime or a chemical dependence. When Jesus reads that passage in the Nazareth synagogue, he announces a mission statement for himself and for his body, the church. Well, it is so easy to feel frustrated and discouraged, especially if you watch the news shows. A world full of violence, a pandemic still raging, social isolations, hunger, poverty, a world where personal freedom is more important than the lives of children or what is best for the community. Perhaps you feel as I do, wondering, where is God? If God is love, if God is all powerful, omnipotent, why is there such suffering in the world? keeps me from falling into despair, helps me to find the joy in life. It's found in this mission statement of Jesus, which is passed on to us. So the question isn't, why doesn't God do something, but 
Why don't I do something? We have been given the power to change the world, not the whole world, but our piece of the world. My daily prayer is, where can my gifts be of help to whomever I might encounter during the day? We don't have to do big things, just little things. Little things like speaking a word of comfort to someone in despair. These little things add together to make big things. And when many of us are doing the little things, then the world changes. Jesus read the old world words from Isaiah and claimed them for his own. We can do the same. So let's read, reread the text with a different perspective. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. The spirit of the Lord has anointed us to bring good news to the poor. The spirit of the Lord has sent us to proclaim release to the captives. The spirit of the Lord has sent us to help the blind recover their sight. The spirit of the Lord has sent us to free the oppressed. The spirit of the Lord has sent us to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in our hearing. Amen.